So now that we've established the ideas and components behind a phylogenetic tree, we're going to look even further into this idea of phylogeny by looking at a topic and uh, subtopic that I would like to call phylogeny development. And we'll entitle this next flowchart Phylogeny Development 1. There'll be two parts to this idea of developing phylogenies. Phylogeny Development Roman numeral one. So how do we look at a phylogeny? How do we develop one? There has to be some sort of basis in terms of making all of these fancy trees. And there is. The main idea behind phylogeny development is the following. We're going to make some inferences. And most of our phylogeny trees, phylogenetic trees, are going to be inferred from two components. Inferred from both morphological so we're going to be looking at shape, structure, characteristics, and also molecular data. Both of these are strong, rather accurate pieces of data that we can look at as scientists and start developing evolutionary history relationships known as phylogenies utilizing phylogenetic trees. More so, looking at this idea of phylogeny development, we can define it broadly as the following. So. When we want to develop a phylogeny, we want to make sure that we look at the following and understand that a phylogeny is simply the evolutionary history of a group of organisms. So it's the evolutionary history of a group of organisms, and now here comes a key word, from a common ancestor. We will always be referring to a common ancestor in phylogenetic tree, phylogenetic development, etc. Evolutionary history of a group of organisms from a common ancestor and that evolutionary history is represented so we can physically represent this as a degree of relationships as a, and we'll explain that, as a degree of what we call relationships how closely things are related to other things, how organisms are related to other organisms, and this degree of relationships in and of itself is based on what we consider similarity of characters. Lots of words, let's dissect it. Similarity of characters. So very big, very specific, um, broad definition. Similarity of characters, so let's repeat this. Evolutionary history of a group of organisms from a common ancestor is represented as a degree of relationships based on similarity of characters. This is what phylogeny is all about. Creating an evolutionary history all stemming from an original common ancestor, but that history is full of relationships and we're going to figure out how things are related to one another based on how similar their characters are to one another. Very strong, powerful, broad definition that we're going to work off for the rest of this flowchart. So we mentioned this idea of character, and we've mentioned it before in previous uh, lectures, but let's reiterate the idea of a character uh, and understand that before we move any further. A character is simply a defined attribute of a species. Defined attribute, attribute, of a species, so one species in the situation. Specifically, it's uh, anything that uh, involves itself in a character state. Characters can be seen in two different states. Either they can be seen in alternate forms of one another. So imagine the character of hair color and the alternate forms of hair color, like brown, blonde, black, whatever you have. And the, another state of a character could be simply the absence of that character altogether. So if we look at organisms and see how similar their character states are, if they're, if they're similar in their absences and similar in their alternate forms of this defined attribute that every single member of the species has, we can then utilize this and create a phylogeny based off of relationship degrees. We're going to be doing that as we move forward. But one last thing I want to mention about characters are there are several different types of characters, some that are more valuable than others in terms of phylogeny. Notice for right now, we are inferring phylogenies based off of morphological and molecular data. Let's look at some character types. We can look at character types simply as structural character types. 
how the organism st structures itself. We can look at it as physiological characters, aka the inner workings of an organism. You know, the immune system, are they similar? Is the nervous system similar amongst different groups of organisms, etc.? So structural, physiological. We also can look at the developmental characteristics that are the same. Remember how we were talking about this in our previous macroevolution? If they develop the same in the embryo, then they possibly are related by a common ancestor. Um, we can also even look at behavioral characteristics. We saw that when we started doing speciation and seeing how reproductive isolation behaviors, much like behavioral isolation works, those are important characters, and also molecular characters. This is something that we'll look at more so in our next flowchart, but just be aware that things like structural and molecular are the most useful when we're trying to create a phylogeny, when we're trying to create a history, the story of an organism and how it relates to its common ancestor and those that are related to it. It's the family tree, in essence, of an organism. So we have the idea of a character developed, and finally we'll conclude this flowchart by stating the following. Character states, so remember, character state is the alternate form or the absence of a character, may be similar for two reasons. So remember how we said that when we want to look at a phylogeny, we want to group degrees of relationships based on similarity of characters. Let's look at that similarity of characters in a little bit more detail. Character states may be similar for two reasons, and these are two contrasting reasons. One is useful to us as a phylogeneticist, let's say, and the other is not so much. The first one that's of great use to us are homologous characters. Homologous. So we're going to define this, and there's one key word you have to remember about homologous characters. These are characters, or let's just say a homologous character is inherited from a common ancestor, and that's it. When you see common ancestor and inheritance of from that common ancestor, that character is automatically homologous. From this point forward, always think homologous. The moment you hear that in terms of phylogeny and evolutionary history, remember it's referring to a common ancestor. Homologous, common ancestor, homologous, common ancestor. Big part of that definition. A big example that we can use is something that we've already stated. Um, a nice example of a homologous character is the mammalian forelimb. The mammalian forelimb, and specifically its structure, its morph, its morphology, a good way to look at phylogeny, remember? Mammalian forelimb structure is incredibly homologous. It's very, very homologous because we see the same exact structure in a cat as we do in a bat, as we do in a human, and as we do in a whale. You would never guess that all four of these organisms share nearly the most identical of four limb structures, yet they do. This very clearly shows us that these four organisms, these four mammals, must have, at one point in their evolutionary history, all come from the same common ancestor. So we'll say from same common ancestor, just to reiterate that it's from a common ancestor and thus it's homologous. The opposite of that is the idea of an analogous character. And this is where students a lot of the times get tripped up um, in the analogous character portion of this uh, lecture. Let me just rewrite that. Uh, the other type is known as analogous. So in the analogous character state, uh, we will be similar based off of what I think of as function. Another way to say analogous is to look at what we call homoplasies between organisms. So organisms have analogous characters and homologous characters. Organisms have analogous characters, otherwise known as homoplasies. Just another way of saying it. We consider analogous characters as independently acquired. Independently acquired. What does that automatically tell you? That tells you that there's a lack of something here. There's a lack of a relationship between a common ancestor. This analogous character does not involve common ancestors. There is no common ancestor inheritance whatsoever in the analogous character state. Once I give you an example, this will make a lot more sense. So this analogous, this homologous character was all pro probably and most likely inherited from the same common ancestor because we see the same structure amongst all of these mammal forelimbs. In the analogous state, we state that characters are not similar because of their uh, relationship to a common ancestor, but characters are similar 
for a totally different reason. They're similar because of similar use, not similar history. So of similar, because of similar use. So two things that have analogous characters have characters that are similar, not because they shared a common ancestor, but because those that character that we're looking at has the same use. So we're going to write also not because not because so character similar because of similar use not because of common ancestor let's say history so there is no common ancestor um, this is known as a convergent evolution when two organisms converge on the same use for something and it is without the idea of a common ancestor they will be convergently evolving convergence is the idea of coming together utilizing the same thing, the same character. Best way to understand this absolutely is through an example, and the key example are wings, but specifically wings, this is a morphological structure, so a good way to look at phylogeny, of course, but specifically wings in two very different organisms, birds and butterflies. What do we notice about these two things? Well, what we notice is that, of course, they serve the same use. Wings in both birds and uh, butterflies have a common use. That is what an analogous character has stated to us. Right over here, character similar because of similar use. What's the common use of both of these wings in birds and butterflies? Of course, it is for flight. Okay, but now we have to look at the phylogeny. Look at the evolutionary history. What do we see? Well, what do we not see? We don't see a common ancestor. No common ancestor of both, both, make sure you write that, of both birds and butterflies. Okay, so no common ancestor of both bird and butterfly had wings. These two uh, organisms have two completely separate phylogenetic trees, yet they converge on the use of wings, not on the history of wings themselves. They converge only on the use, not the common ancestral history. So that covers the first a couple of ideas we want to look at when we're understanding phylogeny development. Always look at the morphology, and we're now going to be looking at molecular data in our next video.